I'm in America, in Spain, in a city, on a dirt track. In theory, I'm in all these places at the same time, somewhere out there. It's just a question of chance. When you really think it through, the implications are, are truly mind-boggling. I've heard that this is not the only universe that might exist, and in many others, identical copies of us can be found. The question is, is it ever possible to find my cosmic twin? Out beyond the boundaries of our bubble of our universe, the cosmos goes on forever, and out there there are an infinite number of other bubbles in which all possible things that can happen are happening, including my cosmic twin in some universe far, far away who is exactly like me but who actually has his hair. And there's yet another sense in which multiverse arises in physics. It's, it's odd that it comes from many different sources. Quantum physics, which is our, our best theory of the really small, seems to give us really good reason to think that there are parallel versions of us, in a sense, right around us now. Yes, there's, there's a multiplicity of, of multiverses. It might be hard to pick which cosmic twin you meet. Somewhere out there in the depth of space, there's another me looking up at a night sky very similar to our own. She's my physical cosmic twin. Right now, I happen to be at MIT. I've come to speak to theoretical physicist Max Tegmark. He tells me that the universe is so big that other versions of us could be found out there. This idea is based on basic probability. The reason we assume it's so big is because of the theory of inflation. In a blink of a blink of an eye, the universe expanded to what we see today. This is inflation, and it's our best model for what happened just after the Big Bang. In the simplest version of inflation, yeah, space isn't just much bigger than the part of space that we can see, but actually infinite, in which case there is one exactly another Melissa and then lots of others, almost Melissas. One named Smelissa and one named Philalissa and Larissa and so on, and speaking all sorts of different languages. And they still look exactly like you. And making the same decisions and having the same thoughts about... Atom for atom identicals. Um, but you don't really need infinity here. I can say a number like 10 to the 10 to the 10, that were the universe of that size, the probability of doppelgangers becomes enormously high. Right? And the numbers of doppelgangers becomes very large. All possible variations on your twinness would be played out somewhere. So for each identical me, there would be many more almost me's, all within this universe. Out there somewhere, I'm good, I'm evil, I'm a horse, I'm a sentient comet hurtling through space, I'm a giant towering over the trees. For these versions to exist, all they need is to abide by the physical laws that govern our universe. But there's another version of inflation, known as eternal inflation, where literally anything goes. I'm a cube. I'm this thing. I'm a bowl of pure energy. And inflation is a very creative force. When it keeps making more and more space, it makes regions of space of all different kinds. This string theory solution number one, the string theory solution number 57. One of them is the one we're in here, where there is six kinds of quarks. The proton is 1,836 times heavier than an electron. Well, it makes some space over here where the proton is 2,016 times heavier than the electron. And so those universes would look very different to this one? They would, and, and it seems like most of them wouldn't even have any stars in them or, or anything even complex enough that it would be alive. So I couldn't find my cosmic twin there? But it's a very big multiverse. If you, suppose we're in a computer game right now. We might be in a computer game that's running on a Windows super future computer, or on some sort of Mac. But we wouldn't even know what the ultimate hardware is, what the ultimate rules of this, of this computer is, because it doesn't affect us, right? We live in this higher software level. It's exactly the same with when you think of these other parallel universes. It might be that even though the fundamental rules are different, the kind of life that can emerge might still feel the same. If I did manage to travel to one of the other universes where the laws of physics as we know them are different, so it's made up don't. of a different amount of Don't, don't do whatever. it. Yeah, exa exactly, what would happen? You would, would die. <laughs> okay, so I couldn't even exist there. And your six quarks look at each other and are like, oh, we're not allowed to exist anymore, poof. Ah. I'm dead. 
I'm alive. I'm both dead and alive. I'm Schrodinger's cat. My own quantum cosmic twin. This is the second possible twin I could find, which arises not from the vastness of the cosmos, but from the microcosmos, the weird world of quantum mechanics. Uh, well, I mean, it, it didn't have to be weird, but it turned out to be weird. In this quantum multiverse, I can exist in many places at once. I'm in Iceland, in a car, in a cave, on a boat, in a room. I exist in all these places at the same time, in overlapping realities. If I look too closely, though, I break the magic. I'm in Oxford with David Wallace. He's explaining a classic interference experiment, which shows that at the quantum scale, particles exist in many states at the same time. But when we look, we can only ever find one. The whole mystery of quantum theory is right there. And it's tempting to think, well, that's just the weird microscopic world. But quite often, for instance, when we look at the microscopic world through measurement devices, or when chaos theory causes very small differences to get scaled up to big differences, or when a cosmic ray comes through and causes a mutation or it doesn't, that quantum mechanical two things at once scales up to a, a macroscopic human scale two things at once. So instead of it just being an electron being here and here at the same time, it's the needle on my measurement device being this way and this way at the same time. And it's me seeing it this way and seeing it this way at the same time and telling you it's here and telling you it's here at the same time. And what is it to say that at the macroscopic world level two lots of things are happening at the same time? Well really that's just a way of saying that there are two worlds, two chunks of reality. Both of them look ordinary, but they're different and they're coexisting. Unfortunately, we can't observe these parallel worlds directly. And confusingly, they're actually created from direct observations of this quantum weirdness. Let me explain. If the electron is on the right, I sit on the right. If the electron is on the left, I sit on the left. But the electron is both on the right and the left. When I look to see where it is, I will only ever find it in one place, say the left. So what happens to the electron on the right? One interpretation seems to suggest it still exists, but in a parallel universe. That at the very point I make the observation, I myself created a parallel world. So that the world right around us is constantly being branched into, into copies which are very similar to each other, and in those copies people pretty much exactly like you, and talking to people pretty much exactly like me. But with slight tweaks or differences, like would you be wearing the same here as you would be somewhere else? I could be, I could not. This is one way in which the many worlds of quantum mechanics aren't quite the parallel universes of sliding doors or other sorts of science fiction. Um, it's not that human choices create the splits, it's, the, it, it's, it's more mundane than that, it's, it's quantum mechanical. But I think that's important because it means that we still are making real choices. If any choice I made um, was such that I made the opposite choice in another world, then it's hard to see in what sense I really made the choice at all. In the quantum multiverse, where every time we make an, an observation, the universe splits in two, and we end up you know, perceiving the one where we say, oh, Electron was over here, and there's this other twin, you know, now you're a quantum twin that perceived the Electron over there, you can't communicate with that other twin. Uh, it's possible that, that in the future, these two quantum universes could merge again. But the only way they can merge is that if you and your twin forget that you were ever different. To understand why the merging of two quantum universes would cause you to lose your memory, remember that the universe, which includes you and your brain, is actually made up of tiny particles that behave as waves. The only way that these universes will therefore merge is when the waves of the two overlap exactly. They would only do so before there were any differences, or if nobody noticed a change. Matter is best understood as itself a wave. Now, is it possible to refocus the waves back together in such a way that you get the same wave pattern that you had at the beginning? And the answer is yes, we can do this. It requires control, but this is entirely manageable. It's very unlikely, I think bordering on in practice impossible, to imagine those experiments ever happening at the scale of you and me. But in the theory there's no sharp cutoff where 
it stops being the case that one world influences another. It's just that that influence falls off very, very quickly. But these quantum worlds are more than just a theory. And here at MIT, they're building quantum computers that harness the power of this quantum weirdness. So the result of a quantum computation comes because you're effectively creating these different worlds and having them recombine. So what happens if you look inside and try and witness these two things going on? That will mess up the computation. So the two parts will no longer be able to interfere because you've gone in and checked. So you've essentially said, ah, we only have this one part. The cool thing is if you, don't, if you hold on for 10 seconds and don't open it until after it's done, this incredibly cool calculation, it will in 10 seconds have figured out something which would take in the world's fastest supercomputer more than the age of our universe to figure out. So even though you couldn't directly see the weirdness, you can see the awesome power of the weirdness. Wow, mind, mind blown. <laughs> <laughs> hey, that's just the way it is. In fact, even though these sound rather different, the quantum multiverse and this physical one are actually in some sense very similar because in one of these universes out over there, so it's exactly identical to our universe, but in our universe here, we had an electron here and there at the same time. I looked and I found it over there. There's another universe out there where I found it over there. That's the only difference between these two universes. So there, there's actually a physical universe out there which contains this other possibility. So this is good news. Even if I can't meet my quantum twin, if I go far enough into space, I might find a physical version of this quantum universe somewhere out there. This brings us back to the cosmic me that arises from the theory of inflation. But just how far away is she? You don't have to go much more than a Googleplex meters. How far is that? A Googleplex is one with a Google zeros after it, and a Google is one with a hundred zeros after it. So, so it's a pretty honking big number, but I can write out how far you have to go. If we can, <laughs> well, this is sort of hard to erase, but it's 10 to the power 1, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, Max eight, arrived eight, at this number by simply calculating the possibility that all the quarks in our visible universe would be arranged the same somewhere else. Is that the worst case scenario though? Is there any chance we could find cosmic versions of ourselves or parallel versions of ourselves a lot closer? Yeah, if space is infinite, there's probably a Melissa closer than this because processes like evolution, for example, really tip the odds a lot in the favor of, of life. You didn't evolve by just some random quarks having to get slapped together and boom, there you were. Nonetheless, I think, even if you erase a lot of zeros from this, this is still way too far for you to actually be able to go there. Does that mean we can never meet that other parallel us? In order to meet your cosmic twin somewhere out there in the universe, I think you would need to have some, you know, form of superluminal communication that would allow you to go through some cosmic wormhole to go and meet them. I mean, there's nothing wrong in the laws of physics that would prevent you from doing that. We just don't know whether that's possible. So maybe one day we could travel to meet our cosmic selves. <laughs> don't, don't invest your money in wormhole stock at this point, because they're probably impossible. But, but there have been many examples of technology that people said, oh, I'm pretty sure that's impossible, even though they couldn't prove it was impossible, and then were later proven wrong. Currently here, in this reality, there's no evidence that wormholes exist. So even this cosmic twin seems to be far too distant to ever meet. So there's no way of essentially proving that this idea is correct? Well, you have to remember that parallel universes aren't a theory. They're a prediction of certain theories. So what we do isn't try to find these parallel universes. We try to test the theories that predicted them. You can't just say, well, I like Einstein's theory, it's kind of cool, but I'm going to opt out of the black holes. It's not optional. Predictions of physics theories aren't like coffee where you can order decaf. You take all of Einstein's predictions or, or from his theory or none. And if you like the theory of inflation we have, which is the best theory we have for what created all this structure in our universe, one of the things it predicts is that space is actually much bigger. Typically, there are parallel universes. All this suggests that our universe is much bigger and richer than we could ever have imagined, which is not only immensely humbling, but also means that my cosmic twin is somewhere out there in the vastness before me. 
we define parallel universes normally as places that we cannot ever go to, so then by definition, no, Max and Melissa here cannot. But of course, we, in the sense of all the Maxes and Melissas that exist, a bunch of us are already there. Think of uh, a story, a story that's written down in a book. There are many copies of that book. How many stories are there? One. Yeah. So you might think, one story, many books. Think of a book as being like a brain, and think of the story that the book contains as being like your mind. Many, many brains, perhaps one mind. Okay, so on that scenario, there may be very large numbers of identical copies to ourselves, but it may be just a single mind that is instantiated in each of those copies. And of course, when one of those copies something happens, it's affected by its environment in some way different from the remainder, then it diverges from the remainder. Then the story told by that person, by that person's physical instantiation, differs from the rest. So in another universe you might have got stuck in traffic or there was an accident. Differences so it meant, emerge, means you didn't absolutely. Turn up. Yeah. But the curious thing about this, I mean the really extraordinary thing, is that it seems that no evidence could possibly bear on the question of whether there's one distributed mind it's multiply instantiated or multiple minds, each qualitatively identical. It seems that there's no experiment that could be formed, no computation or calculation that could be performed, nothing really that we could learn about the mind that could bear on the question. So perhaps I am my cosmic twin and she is me. And somewhere out there, in the depths of space, she's out there searching for her cosmic twin. I'm there with her too. We're at the beach.